Our next speaker is Dred Scott. Dred Scott is an internationally renowned maker of performances, installations, videos, photographs, prints, and paintings. Uh, in all mediums, his work is animated by a revolutionary spirit that draws from the past in order to inspire a more just future. Dred, thank you so much for being with us today. The floor is yours. Um, thanks for having me. Uh, I hope my video is coming through. And um, uh, yeah, so um, th th we don't have a lot of time, so I'm just going to jump into a presentation of some art and then some of my thoughts about it. I'm going to show, I think, five projects, four or five projects, um, some of which are more community involved, some of which are more just uh, traditional performance, although when I say traditional, that's a little um, odd because most of my performances take place in public spaces, sometimes with permission, sometimes without. Um, and then they often get represented in museum or gallery contexts. But I'm just gonna start by showing performances and then with a context of, of somewhat saying that preservation or retention or representation of the work beyond the actual live performance is sometimes more straightforward or easy with some works than it is with others. So um, I'm gonna share my screen and I am hopefully going to try a trick that uh, um, people say works is not optimizing for video and hopefully the, that you'll be able to still see the video. So let's see whether, whether I'm right. Um, but the first video is just a performance that I did that um, well, it's money yeah. to burn, money 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 to burn. Does anybody have any money to burn? Does anybody have any money to burn? Money to burn. Do you have money to burn? Money to burn. 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 Money to burn, money to burn, money to burn, money to burn. Does anybody have any money to burn?
so with work like this, it is basically a performance that happened live. It happened in public. And video is the way that I actually represent this work. Um, but that is a question because video is somewhat linear and, and almost pedestrian. And so some of the tension that existed in the piece, um, you know, it was a 45 minute performance that got compressed to a three and a half minute video. And some of the tension about what are the police gonna do and how is the audience gonna react and what are the, the traders gonna say is encoded and embedded within the video, but some of it's missing. But that's still pretty straightforward and simple. A lot of performance has been documented by film or video. Um, but most of the performances I do, I sh document by, I mean, the after the fact, by um, still photography. And but there, th because that tension between the live performance, which for me is primary, and the representation of it in space, um, it, if it's done with, with uh, still, it can actually allow the, the experience that an audience may have had live to be sort of brought to imagining what fills in a single or a couple of, of uh, large-scale performance stills. Um, but we can talk more about that later. This is not my work, but I wanna show this as background, especially for people that are not uh, based in the United States. Um, this is a, a, a fire hosing of civil rights demonstrators in 1963. The man who ordered it was a man named Bull Connor um, and the people who were having fire hoses turned on them are uh, civil rights demonstrators, uh, mostly young in um, Birmingham, Alabama. And they were trying to end le legalize discrimination in the United States, particularly in the South, which was commonly called Jim Crow. Um, and so one of the, the questions in seeing photographs like this that we often think about is, the, often they're presented is, this is how horrible it was in the South back then. And on the one hand, it is true, this is horrible. Um, to have a fire hose turned on you and there were barking German shepherd dogs in the area as well. Um, and the question is sort of, you know, yes, things may have changed. There is not any formal legalized discrimination, um, although there is still major discrimination and in, in racial injustice in the United States, but the, the legal denial of entry for say black people to be able to go in the front door of a restaurant or order food or uh, go to a class that, that it has white children in it, that's been formally eliminated. Um, but looking at these pictures, one of the things I began to see was more of the question of why would people endure having a fire hose turned on them? So it's not actually an image that shows oppression and tremendous oppression, which it does, but it actually shows tremendous courage and resistance. And part of why people would be willing to endure this was as unjust and terrible as a society is that, say, forces Black people to, you know, walk in the back door to get food. I don't know that many people, if that was the only thing wrong with the society or their existence, would have risked jail and death to, to be a demonstrator. But the problem is that in, in America, and particularly at that time, the, the violence that was perpetrated on the Black community, people could be killed for, and for any reason or no reason whatsoever. Um, Klan and racial terror in general was the thing that, that reinforced the fact that if Black people didn't behave in a subservient way, they could be killed for that. And so these are images of tremendous courage. So I did a performance um, in uh, 2014 called On the Impossibility of Freedom in a Country Founded on Slavery and Genocide, where I walked into the high pressure water jet of a fire hose. I had firemen turn a fire hose on me. And the performance was a durational performance where I walked into this water jet and, and for as long as I could. Um, and there was a crowd of about 500 people that watched it. Um, and these are the two photos. These are two performance stills, which I basically show the performance now. And so there's a lot that's left out. People often say, well, can we see video of it? The video tends to be both less dramatic, but actually more closed off in a certain way. And so these stills are the ways that I actually represent the performance. And a lot of what people saw, the tension of what I'd be hurt was, you know, was, you know, how long could this go on? And those, that tension I think is in, enclosed within the photographs, but isn't actually present in the video. 
and one of the things that that even this gesture with my hands up this this, this performance happened in October of 2014 which is about two months after the world heard the name Mike Brown for the first time Mike Brown was a young black man who was killed by police in Ferguson Missouri and uh, his death became one of the first major sort of instances where the the movement that became known as Black Lives Matter sort of really fought against police murdering and brutalizing people. I mean, pe the police have murdered Black people for ever since Black people have been in the United States and police forces have been codified. Um, and there's been activists that have been fighting against it, you know, in the 30s and the 60s and the 70s, um, but really in the, the 2000s and 2010s, um, it took a new sort of leap in, in understanding in popular society. So the gesture of my hands up, a lot of activists were saying, hands up, don't shoot, um, indicating that they were unarmed and the police are still shooting them, which is the gesture that, that Mike Brown uh, did before he was murdered by the police. This is a performance called Dred Scott Decision, um, which is a performance that existed in uh, BAM, the Brooklyn Academy of Music in, in their black box theater, BAM Fisher. Um, and it was done in 2012. And I'm just gonna show you a few stills from it. And this performance, one of the things that's important to understand is the, the audience is an important element of the work. And so it consisted of three key elements. I wrote read from the Dred Scott Decision, which was an 1857 Supreme Court ruling um, that was brought by a man named Dred Scott, um, who was an enslaved man. He was suing for his freedom. He got taken to a state where slavery was formally outlawed, and he decided to sue for his freedom. And the Supreme Court ruled in 1857, amongst other things, that there are no rights that a Black person has that a white man is bound to respect. That is almost a verbatim quote from part of the ruling. The 41-page the Supreme Court ruling is a well-articulated, thought-out argument for white supremacy, and it's rooted in U.S. law and English law and custom, um, and, and specifically cites the U.S. Constitution and the Declaration of Incom Independence as its rationale for the ruling. And so I read verbatim from this text. There were four nude Black performers that were being harassed and controlled by live German Shepherd dogs. And then the audience was an active element of the, the work. They didn't know that, that was what was going to happen, but they got lined up and um, had to go through these stanchions and then cross this line of black men. The men sometimes were standing shoulder to shoulder, as you see here. Sometimes they were far apart. Sometimes they were lying on the ground. And so the audience had to make a decision of what to do to get to the line of voting booths that was set up. And they didn't, didn't know what was in the voting booth. And then the voting booth with a questionnaire that um, they had to fill out. It was very short. It had one question that basically said um, that the Black people were enslaved in the United States up until 1865. Uh, sort of, yeah. Uh, and then after that period, 13 sort of, sort of after that period, they continued to be worked in, in enslaved like conditions. And then most recently, one third of all black men or all black male descendants of the enslaved would be in prison and that neither presidential candidate has any plans to stop this mass incarceration a a vote for either candidate and this was done just before a presidential election um in which barack obama was running against and i forget who at this point um but uh it's a, a vote for either candidate implies acceptance of continuing this legacy and uh and then it said will you you will or will not vote in the upcoming presidential election and filling in your name and so nothing in the the questionnaire would alter the performance although it was something that people would have to think about um and so this was them people you know casting their ballots publicly and then the audience was really part of the work and it was a performance that lasted 75 minutes and get, the dogs were barking the entire time it was one of the loudest and longest performances I've ever been part of, even though I'm going to show you a performance which was much longer, but this was very, it was, it was very loud and almost torturous in some ways. Um, and so how, how does one document a performance and preserve a performance that where the audience experience on audience participation is an important aspect of it? How do you videotape a performance that um, sort of has elements where sort of the black performers who were nude actually have the power in the room, but a video would actually almost accentuate their nudity and undermine the, the power that they had, even though the, the audience of, of largely 
white but not exclusively white people were clothed and in typical 21st century dress. Um, how do you preserve the emotions and conversations that went on? And then there was an element where the performance was, I asked the, the audience to take some of, I, they received a gift if they filled out the questionnaire and the gift was a, an artwork a reprodu that reproduced the text of the questionnaire and an image of the historic Dred Scott um, and asked them to display it in their, their homes and have conversations about it. So how do you preserve that? Um, and this is the final performance I'm going to show you. It's a performance called Slave Rebellion Reenactment. And unlike the other performances, this is a community engaged artwork. It is a performance, but it is a community engaged performance. And so th what many people think of as the performance is a two day spectacle that uh, where 350 black and indigenous people marched for two days covering 24 miles on the outskirts of New Orleans um, and uh, uh, we marched from a town called uh, Kenner to a town called Laplace um, in period costume of what enslaved people uh, wore in 1811. The largest rebellion of enslaved people in the United States happened in 1811 where enslaved people tried to rise up and seize all of Orleans territory, which is what is modern day Louisiana and establish an African Republic that would have outlawed slavery, much the way it was done in Haiti a few years earlier. And so Laplace is about 35 miles from New Orleans. We marched along the, the Mississippi River, along the levees, um, and marched sometimes through towns and, and, and villages and communities, but mostly we were on the levee, but people going to work or coming you know, home from jobs or going shopping would have seen this spectacle that would have been sort of tremendously unusual and would have been a place where people would sort of have the opportunity to rethink a lot of questions, especially given that in addition to the period costume, we had muskets and machetes and sickles and sabers, and we were making a lot of noise and we chanted on to New Orleans, freedom or death, we're going to end slavery, join us. But as I said, people think of it as this two day spectacle, which covered a lot of space, which is important, but it really was a community engaged project. So the project took about seven years to make. And some of the people who were participants, the, the reenactors began working on it about six years before it happened. Most of them much more recently, most of them closer to six months to six weeks before, but it involved me meeting with, this is a meeting with the Black Student Union of Tulane University. Tulane is a large private um, uh, university in New Orleans. It's a, it's a, a, quality, it's a quality school and um, it has a small black population, but black students do have a union and they get together and they talk. And so I met with them. I also had a lot of lunches and dinners with people. This is a, a, a documentation of um, a dinner that's being held very early in the process uh, by an arts organization called Antenna, which is the organization that produced and presented the artwork. Um, and I don't live in New Orleans. I live about 1500 miles from New Orleans. And New Orleans is very protective of its history. It's been sort of used and abused and exploited in a lot of ways. Um, and the people don't necessarily like outsiders coming in and appropriating their culture. And so a lot of the work was winning the sort of permission of the community to do this project in their community, but also involving them in the project in as deep and ongoing and sustained ways as possible. And so it involved just lots of you know meeting and getting to know people and talking with them. Um, we, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. But one of the things that that uh, we had to do if we were trying to recreate and re reenact this rebellion was we had to have costumes. And a lot of times, if you think about what enslaved people wore in the U.S., particularly based on the the first substantive popular uh, modern day uh, bringing to life a story about slavery, which was Alex Haley's Roots, which appeared in 1977, a lot of the costuming. Um, and the, 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 that people and the images that people had was the enslaved people wore sort of uh, burlap sacks and cheap clothing. Well, largely it's true, the clothing was cheap, but both it was regionally specific and, and people didn't only wear burlap sacks. And so we did a lot of research looking at um, drawings and lithographs from um, the the, the time, particularly in the French colonial uh, part of the slaving empire that was Martinique, Guadeloupe, and, and Saint-Domingue, um, but also looking at runaway slave ads. But one of the things we noticed was a lot of times men had turbans, which these were men that were enslaved in West Africa, which is hot. And, you know, the, the, the uh, uh, 
people that were the enslaved, but also the, the seamstresses and skilled laborers and designers were taking what they knew to be um, a way to work for long hours in hot, uh, hot sun. And, and so there were turbans, there were stripes, there were all sorts of different colors. And if you look at the runaway slave ads, there was a range of description of what people wore. And so the costume department did drawings of that. And then we had sewing circles because this was a community engaged project. And so we wanted to meet people and talk with them about the project. There were town hall meetings that happened in addition to the lunches and dinners that I showed you images of. But the man on the right, Sly Watts, just learned to sew. He was learning from the uh, woman on the left um, who was in our costume department. Sly is sewing his own costume. There were sometimes when people um, you know, that were say too elderly to participate, they made costumes for younger people or sometimes people were white that wanted to, make, to support the project and they made costumes for some of the, the people. Sometimes people lived in a different region and couldn't come. And so there were ranges of ways that we allowed and encouraged people to connect with the project and one of them was these sewing circles. We did walks to see if, you know, us weak 21st century people could walk as far as uh, our, our, you know, the, the people in the 19th century. Um, and also we needed to make sure that there weren't dogs that would be, you know, let off the leash in, when we went into the communities. And so there's, you know, aspects of, of just like people walking and talking and getting to know each other. We designed flags because we know that the size of the rebellion was at least 500 people, a general at the time. General Wade Hampton wrote to Governor at the time, Governor Claiborne, and said there are 500 brigands in the field. They're marching in formation under flags. And so we know the size of the, the rebellion. We know that they were disciplined and sort of looked like an army, but we don't know what the flags were. So I had to imagine what people might make, what symbols and imagery they might use to cut across linguistic differences, to cut across cultural differences. Sometimes the people that were captured in regions of, of West Africa might have been at war with each other and suddenly are working side by side or having to fight side by side to get free. And so what were the images that they might have used to unite themselves? This, the project also crosses time in some ways. And so this is an adinkra that you might see in contemporary Ghanaian clothing um, that means hope and confidence. I don't know whether it would ever be used at this scale, this large, um, or whether it existed in the 1800s, but that's not the point. Um, this is Louisiana Creole. Um, it's not misspelled French, um, which would have been the language that would have been popular at the time. And many slave revolts had liberty or death or death or liberty on flags. And this is a, um, a uses imagery that would have been appealing to people who followed um, Shango, who was a Yoruba god, or uh, uh, Orisha. Um, and we had practices to learn how to walk more like an army that with some discipline. And so, you know, we didn't want to just look like people walking. Um, and this is a brief video talk, people talking about why they might choose to participate or not. Recruiting others into it. Why would you, you know, a 21st century guy, want to go walk 26 miles in some French colonial clothing? Because this crazy guy named Dred Scott <laughs> asked me to do it. The idea of people coming together to pool their energy in that way. I feel like we really need that. This is the closest that I'll ever be able to come to experiencing what my ancestors experienced. I'm surrounded by comfort. So what happens if I eliminate all that and just the only connection that I have is with the people and the purpose. It's important for this generation to know that you're not the descendants of slaves, you're descendants of people that were enslaved and you're at your current position because of the resistance. To know that your ancestors fought is enough to build up a sense of dignity for a child. So like if people do know about this history, I think it'll spark rebellion in people today. People are reevaluating the position of black people in American society in a way that they haven't for about 40 years. And it's not just for black people. This is a question of people who wish to be free from this oppressive society. Well, I think just in white supremacist culture, there's this idea of disconnecting like myself from the people that came before me that I'm related to. I have to own that narrative. I have to be honest with that, how that's influenced me. What's that granted? I don't think it's a reenactment. I think this is um, learning about the material, social, spiritual costs, but also the practice of insurrection. And so now I'm gonna show some performance still of the, the actual performance that these um, are how the performance largely lives in, in an afterlife after the performance. 
um, that are four by six foot. Um, and, uh, but this also shows what you might have seen if you were, you know, driving by or walking by or plan to come see the performance live. And you'll notice if you're looking at these that there's all these sort of backdrop or references to the modern day. When a lot of people think about reenactment, they talk about um, where they sort of attempt to take an audience back to the past and say, this is exactly how it was, say if it was a, 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 a civil war reenactment, which is the main reenactment tradition in the United States. Um, and they just sort of will try and say, this is how it was exactly in 1863. And so they'll go to a field where there isn't any imagery, any modern imagery. And I, as a visual artist, am much more interested in, in the clash between the past and the present. And so it's not that as a visual artist, I didn't have enough money to be able to do this in an area where, wouldn't, where there wouldn't be oil refineries. The oil refineries and the gated communities and the strip malls are very much the point of the project. This is a, a, an army from 1811 that is teleported across time. The audience hasn't moved across time. The, the reenactors have moved out of time and into our present and ruptured into our present. And the thing particularly about this image that's that's important to understand is that um, in the, the early 1800s, sugar was the main uh, crop and the motor of the economy that enslaved people were forced to cultivate and grow and process. Um, Oil, you know, in the early 1900s became the dominant economy in the world, but including in the, this region. And so the sugar plantations had to go. And so the oil refineries were put down literally on top of sugar plantations. And in some cases, literally on top of the graves of enslaved people. Um, and so they're also highly toxic. And so many of the people who live in this region are poor, not all the people, and many of them are black. And so they're the descendants of the people that were enslaved in this region where they were being worked to death and killed on sugar plantations. And now this toxic um, polluting oil industry, but other petrochemical plants are poisoning people in the area. This is an area or region known as Cancer Alley. And in fact, there was just a, a victory um, that, that activists in that community won. Uh, a, uh, they were trying to open up a neoprene plant that produces the, the, the uh, material that is used in like um, scuba diving. It's, it's highly toxic and one of the precursors for it is a known carcinogen. And they were finally able to, and, it, and th this plant would have sort of had environmental and uh, uh, sort of effects that would be far beyond what the government is supposed to allow. But plants like that exist in this region, largely because the people are poor and largely because they're black. Um, but activists were able to stop it. And the, the incidence of cancer in this region is about 50 times what it is in the rest of the country. And so having this army of the enslaved, this liberating army march past this region is actually part of the point. It's not an accident. It's actually a feature of the project. And this is the army of the enslaved sort of making it into the city of New Orleans itself. Um, and so this is a brief 30 second video of what, what this sort of performance looked like if you were in, this is outside the town of Norco, um, which is where the refinery you just saw is, and people might have seen as they got up to get their Saturday morning paper. So this was not a project about slavery. This was a project about black joy, about liberation and freedom. One of the reenactors after, after the uh, performance said, I felt like I finally got a chance to represent someone who most people may not even know exists. And that's a lot of the heart of the project. This, this history is robbed from people. And people, if you think your ancestors were slaves, you might behave one way in the present, including about thinking how things could change. But if you think your ancestors are freedom fighters, then you might have a different 
vision of how things can change now and what you might do in the present. The project, a lot of my work goes from the streets into museums, but also sometimes goes through the media. And so this is me, me being interviewed on CNN by Christian Amanpour, which was an, one of their lead correspondents. And so getting work preserved, documented, represented in that way is important. Um, and this is an exhibition of the work at a gallery in New York. The work has been shown in at a Kunsthal in Amersfoort uh, in the Netherlands. It's been shown in a museum in, in St. Louis. Um, and this is a museum in, in the Bowery in New York. And so that you see these large scale performance stills and the flags, the ephemera from them are there. Um, and, but I wanna come back. This is, this is a short video that the Guardian newspaper made when, and they were talking with some of the reenactors um, sort of just right before it. And so the, their thoughts are important. Today will be very emotional, spiritual, as we are literally walking past oil refineries and strip malls and other locations that were previously sugar plantations. I know this may not be the appropriate time, but my family owns this land. I grew up here, my mother, my grandfather, and just from me, from my family and my ancestors who may have been a part of this, I just want to say thank y'all for what y'all are doing. Uh, because nothing like this has ever been done. So thank y'all very much. I appreciate it. And so that last person was just a person who lived in the area, did not know this performance was coming by her door. We didn't meet her beforehand. And so it's in a certain sense, it's not part of the performance, but it very much is part of how, how the performance is received and perceived and our questions about how do you preserve something like this? Um, and I want to just come back to the performance itself. So if you want to know more about my work, you can look at my website, dreadscott.net, or follow me on Instagram at dreadscottart. And I will stop here and just say that the, this question um, of, you know, what, with particularly with community engaged performance, this is people were working on this for six or seven years in some cases. There were hundreds of people, both people that were reenactors, but also people that were in the community in other ways. There were people sewing costumes, there were city officials, there's all sorts of information that how do you preserve and what is important to preserve. But beyond that, the question of experience, much with, with um, Dred Scott decision, the audience was part of the project. They were actually part of the artwork. And in this case, there's the audience that sees the artwork that, that that's interesting. So the woman on the side of the road, her experience of, hey, there's nothing like this. Nobody comes here and does this. This is really meaningful to her. But then there's the experience of the performers, which are the heart of the project. The project has 350 people that it's their project. It's not my project. It's a community engaged collaborative performance. And all these people had different ideas and experience that are really, really important and are not just as, even as simple as, oh, if we just interview some of them, we get it all. That's part of it, but is really the performance exists in their heads and how they embody the ideas of the performance in an ongoing way. And I don't know that that can be captured or should be. The point is that it actually is, it exists and the performance in this way continues. And so. I will leave it at that. That's my presentation. We can have a conversation and do Q&A now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dred. Um, and, you know, I have to say, I, uh, you know, I've had the, the uh, I, I'm fortunate to have been able to, to speak with you about some of these things before. And I still, I have so many questions and I have to say, it's, I always find it so moving to hear from especially the younger participants about how meaningful it was to them and what it meant to them to, to participate in this work. Um, we have a lot of great questions and I don't want to hog the Q&A, but there's something that, that I really wanna ask. Um, so you spoke already um, 
very thoughtfully about the relationship, I think, between the past that you're summoning um, with um, uh, slave rebellion reenactment um, and the contemporaneity of the, you know, contemporary Black American experience, um, the contemporary landscape that you were moving through. Um, you know, you have people who are wearing historical costumes, very lovingly made by your costume designer, but also wearing modern sneakers. Um, but there's a third element to this work too, which I think is equally important. That's neither really about historical accuracy nor about being true to the contemporary moment, but is this utopian element about mm -hmm. um, kind of using the past to think about how, you know, exactly as you're saying that having this knowledge about, um, about one's ancestors can change the way you approach what's possible in the future. And I wonder if you could um, talk a little bit about the, the kind of utopianism in that work and, and how you kind of deliberately, you know, even with all of your research and all of your knowledge about this event, you deliberately departed from some of the um, kind of historical, you know, specifics. Yeah. So the, the main departure that, that you know that perhaps the other people at this conference don't know is that the, the rebellion was put down and it was put down really violently in a, in a truly medieval way. I mean, you know, the, the brutality that was meted out to the, the rebellion um, was something that many people think of as something that occurred in, you know, the 1500s or 1400s or 1300s and not in modern history. But actually the history of the repression of slave revolts. And even, you know, as we're recently seeing with the, the death of the, the Queen of England and people say, well, you know, look, do you know what happened in Kenya in just the, the, the 60s? Do you know the torture that people were put through? So, but, so that when we think of medieval, it's actually still very present, but the repression against the, this rebellion was just barbaric and savage. And the people who sort of perpetrated it were sort of enslavers and, and largely white and, and, and friends of enslavers. And so that repression though, if, if you think about slavery for just a minute, even if you don't know the gory horrific details, you know that it was a system that was enforced through violence and brutality and that largely white people did horrible things. That's not new. That's not news that's, you know, people should think about that and make art about it and people should engage with just what slavery was. But the story here, what's new and what people don't know is that these enslaved people had the most radical idea of freedom in the United States at the time. I mean, you know, people look at the United States, oh, it's the cradle of democracy or bastion of democracy or first, you know, and they talk about, you know, the, the writings of Thomas Jefferson and, and, and George Washington. And it's like, yeah, those guys were enslavers. They owned people and at every chance where they could have liberated their slaves, they didn't. And in fact, each of them, but particularly Jefferson, continually sided with the system of enslavement. It wasn't even just them personally owning slaves, as horrific, as barbaric as that is, but it's they, they were the head of a system of enslavement whose economy was rooted in and found the entire wealth of the modern world, but particularly specifically America, is built on slavery. Whether you're in the North or the South, whether you're an Ivy, you know, whether you're Harvard University or whether you're the descendants of, of plantation owners from, from the South, that's where American wealth is. And the same is true of you know, wealth in England, Spain, Portugal, and, and France. That's that's these were slaving empires in the modern world that we have, the wealth and riches that exists the planes, the trains, the buildings, all of that, it comes from exploiting people for hundreds of years. And so people should know about that, but these enslavers that talked about freedom, their conception of freedom was predicated on owning people. The enslaved had an idea that's a freedom that's much more consistent with what you and I think of as freedom. Mm. And that is a society that doesn't have slavery at its foundation. And so yeah. um, this thing of, there is an importance of going back to that past, but highlighting the rebellious aspect is much more true to reality and much more an unknown and buried history than just saying slavery was brutal. And it actually somewhat for artistic movement gets at a bit of questions. There's a lot of focus on black bodies now and the wounds and trauma that black bodies suffered. And that work is important, but it's really important to know, wait, these were the visionary thinkers, in, including in the political realm of their time, and they had an audacious plan to get free. That's inspiring and something people should learn, and so, which gets at the utopian nature. And so 
there is an aspect that was utopic about it, but it was more, we created a liberated space where people could actually both for a brief period, you know, 48 hours be free in some ways, but also could dream about how they could take that spirit from the past, whether it involves rising up and seizing Orleans territory or whether it involves doing some voting thing or whether it involves setting up a company, whatever. I'm not, the project was not specific about how people carried that spirit forward, but it was really trying to ingrain in the 350 reenactors and then as well as the audience more broadly, like go live in that past in the spirit of people, Charles Delans and Kimana and Cook and Jupiter and, and Marie Rose, who had this idea of no matter what it takes, we have to overthrow the system of enslavement. And yes, it will be difficult. And yes, it will risk our lives and our families' lives and our friends' lives. But that is the only way we can actually get free. And so if people take that spirit and then sort of live that in the present, it's both utopic, but it's also a roadmap to get free now. And so that's the connection where it wasn't um, saying how to be an activist or what to do or how to live, but it is like, look, take that spirit, learn from that, learn from the strength and vision and not necessarily the specific political plans, but the vision of, wait, the problem is we're enslaved. The solution, no matter what it takes is in slavery, get free. And so that is in the heads of all the people that embody this, this spirit in, in, in the performance. Yeah, thank you. And I would say, you know, as exactly as you were saying, I think uh, it's completely fair to call that, um, to call that a form of preservation of the work, the fact yeah. that the spirit of it lives on in the, in the people who, who participated. Um, so we have, uh, I think, a really intriguing question from Michaela. Um, we have previously talked about reappropriation of history in relation to reenactment. Can you relate to that? And if so, in what sense? And Michaela, um, feel free to, to jump in and, and expand on your question if you like. Um, do you, do you wish, I saw a person appear for a second and then disappear. <laughs> Are yes, you going I, to I, expand on it? I, I was just, yeah, because in a sense, of course you have answered it, but maybe you could expand on it a little bit if we, if we still yeah. have time. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, I mean, first off, I will answer with what I understand the question to be, but I, I, I will say, you know, I don't read a lot of academic theory around issues like this. And so the question of reappropriation of history, I approach in a sort of as a naive artist and naive historian. I'm not a historian. I work with historians and I have a lot of respect for the historians I work with. Um, and there is a question of deploying history so that people can think about the present. And I think uh, with a, a lot of historians, they, they're they really thinking, I mean, good histor radical historians are really thinking about, I mean, you know, they're history nerds and they get into the history, they're really interested in the minutia, but they really want people in the present to not just think about the past, but think about what does that tell us about now? And, you know, a lot of historians, they the the work is discovering and rooted in being accurate and having a fidelity to history whereas as an artist i can kind of dream and mess with it somewhat and so you know i can have modern day shoes and modern day glasses and modern day oil refineries to say this is not history but it's in the present and it's commingling in a way and so the the, the part of the question though is what history do you take i mean with slave rebellion reenactment or with uh, on the impossibility of freedom in a country founded on slavery and genocide, which is looking at the history of, of um, you know, the, the, the brutality against civil rights demonstrators, but also the courage of civil rights demonstrators or other works like that. There, It is, what history do you focus on? Because the past is just the past. And, and you know, anything that happened in the past is history. And we as artists or historians or scholars could choose to look at anything. The question is, what is most sort of useful, and I don't mean in a, a, a pragmatic sense, but what, what, what can speak, what are some unresolved contradictions that exist in our present that the past can help us understand and, and work on? And so, you know, in a certain sense, by and large, chattel slavery doesn't really exist in the modern world. 
I mean, it, it does in some forms and there are other forms of slavery that do exist, but that's, but slavery by reenactment wasn't about that per se, but the societies that were founded upon and, and the, the wealth and enrichment through enslavement that don't have slavery anymore have, you know, they're fighting wars to dominate the planet. They're, you know, they've got nuclear weapons pointed at each other. They could have police that murder, you know, Mike Brown. They have, um, you know, people that are dying of COVID because they live stacked on top of each other and don't have access to medical care. And white supremacy rationalizes the, the organization of our contemporary society. So looking back at, at a, a period of slavery where people thought, A, slavery was terrible, let's, we're glad that it's over, and B, slavery, people resisting enslavement, including by taking up arms to resist it are righteous, that can tell us a lot about the present. And so it does reappropriate, but it also, again, I'm an artist, I'm not a historian, I try and learn as much about the history as possible, but one of the freedoms that I have, and, and I talk with my historian friends about it, and it's interesting how they under, they, they say, well, like the invention of the flags that I, I did, that is something that they haven't necessarily had to think about. They have to research and say, what were the flags? And I, I can say, well, we don't know. And so what were the reasons people might have made flags and what would they possibly have come up with? And even if my speculation is inaccurate, it actually points to some of the thinking and questions that would have been in the heads of people back then and now. And so those those questions of what passed and how you how you use it and whether you have a fidelity to it or whether your sort of feet are rooted in the present and the future and are trying to just sort of, you know, utilize that past um, is I think how I, how I look at it. Thank you. Um, thanks so much, Dred. And um, thanks everyone for your great questions. Unfortunately, um, we're out of time right now, but we will absolutely, um, pick those back up at the panel discussion. Um, so so um, take them with you. Dred, thank you again so much. That was really fascinating. Cool, I'm glad that you like it. I, I actually wanna try and save the chat before it closes. And, and thanks for everything. And I hope you, the rest of your uh, symposium and conference is good. Thanks for having me, bye. Thanks. <laughs>